up where we left off last week, and uh, if I remember right, we stopped at verse number 10. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, verse number 10. It says, And he, talking about the angel, The angel carried me away in the spirit to great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, I want you to notice that this city, this new Jerusalem, is descending out of heaven. I want you to underline that phrase, out of. That phrase is translated from the Greek preposition, ek. And that's very important because the preposition ek denotes the origin of something. In other words, where something comes from. So what this is really telling us is that the new Jerusalem was originally a city in heaven. But when the new earth is created, this city is going to descend from its original place in heaven and it's going to make its permanent residence upon the new earth. But right now, where is that city located? In heaven. So let me ask you a question. When you think of heaven, how do you picture it? And I want you to be honest. Do you think of heaven as some type of spiritual, surreal place? With celestial beings that's kind, that kind of float in the air. You know, the angels are on these clouds and they're playing a harp. Is that what comes to mind? Kind of like the scene in the movie, uh, what was it, Heaven Can Wait with Warren Beatty? Let's run that video if you don't mind. My watch stopped. Look at that. It keeps flashing the same time. <laughs> I'm dreaming, huh? <laughs> now, I could have ran more, but, but that kind of gives you the idea. How many of you ever seen the movie? It's really a good movie. You know, Warren Beatty's this athlete, and what happens is that's his guardian angel, and he's driving or riding his bicycle into a tunnel, and it looks like he's going to run straight into a car, so his guardian angel actually pulls him out. But what he didn't realize is that being an athlete, he had the reaction to be able to miss and not, and not be hurt at all. And so the guardian angel actually pulls him out before his time, before he actually dies, and then they've got to send him back, and of course it's all fiction. But anyways, did you notice how they pictured heaven? It's kind of this surreal place. It's this place where there's clouds and everything's kind of transparent. Is that how you picture heaven? Is that how you think of heaven? Some of you are saying no. Some of you are saying yes. Well, let me just say this. Heaven is not like that. According to the Bible, heaven is a city. It's a physical city with walls, with streets, with homes. You see, somewhere down the line, we got the wrong impression of heaven. We have the wrong image. It's an image that's not biblical. And let me prove that to you. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse number 10. I want to correct your impression of heaven tonight. It says, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. Now, I want you to notice that Abraham perceived heaven to be a city, a city designed and built by God, a city with eternal foundations. In other words, a city that would never be destroyed, a city that would last for all of eternity. But just because Abraham perceived of heaven in this way doesn't mean that heaven is like that, does it? So is heaven a city? When we die, do we go to a city or do we go to a place like what we saw in the video? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 16, and let's find out. It says, but they, it's talking about all of the people of faith, they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. For God has prepared a city for them. Abraham was right. According to this verse, God has prepared a city for those who have faith and trust in him. So heaven, in the sense that we think of heaven, is a city. Now, this city is God's home. The city that I'm talking about that's in heaven 
is actually the home of God. It's where he lives. Look at Revelation chapter 21. We're going to kind of go backwards, row the script backwards a little bit, and look at verses 2 and 3. Notice what it says. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home. Did you catch that? Is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Now, the implication from verses 2 and 3 is that God's home is in this city that is descending down upon the new earth. Now, if you look back at verses 2 and 3 and let me read certain verses, you'll notice what I'm talking about or, or certain parts of it. Notice what it says. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look. God's home is now among his people. So these verses imply that God lives in this city. It is his home. It's where he lives. So heaven is both a city and it's also God's home, just like Jesus said in John the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 3. If you don't mind, go ahead and turn to the book of John, chapter 14. Let me read those three verses. Jesus was teaching and he said this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house. Now that word house is a very interesting word. That word house is the Greek word oikia. It refers to where you live. It's your home. So he says, in my Father's home are many mansions. Now let me ask you a question before we finish reading this. How can God's home have many mansions? I mean, let's think about this. How big would your home have to be to have other homes inside of it? But Jesus says, in my Father's home are many mansions. How can God's home have many mansions inside of it? Well, it can because God's home is a city. Does that make sense? God's home is this new Jerusalem. And this city is a huge city that has many mansions in it. Now, let's keep reading. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. But here's my point. I want you to catch this tonight. The city that John is describing in Revelation chapter 21 is located in heaven at this present time. I don't mean in the future. I mean right now. The very city that Jesus or John is describing in Revelation chapter 21 is in heaven right now. In fact, it is heaven in the sense that we think of heaven. Because it's where we're going when we die. When you die, you're going to this city that John is describing in Revelation chapter 1. Or if Jesus happens to come before we die, it's where we're going to go when we are raptured. We're not going to go to this uh, ethereal uh, or the, the surreal place that's up in, in, in the sky with all of these clouds. No, we're actually going to this city. So, and so heaven, in the sense that we think of it, is a city with walls and streets and mansions. And as I said, it's located right now in the heavenly realm. But one day it's going to descend down from heaven and it is going to be located permanently on the new earth. Are we all on the same page? Does everyone get that? So get out of your mind that when we go to heaven, you're going to see angels floating on clouds playing a harp. And you're going to be walking and really it's like there's nothing below you but these clouds are kind of around you. That's not what heaven is going to be like. Any questions on where you go when you die? All right. Now, in verses 11 through 23, John describes this city, the New Jerusalem. And let me break it down for you. In verse number 11, he just gives us a, a very general description of the city. In verses 12 through 14, he describes the city's walls, gates, and foundation. In verses 15 through 17, he gives us the measurements of this city. And in verses 18 through 21, he describes some of the more special features of the city. And though John is giving us a very good description of what this city is like, let me just assure you that it's going to far exceed all of our expectations. It's going to be greater than we can imagine. So even though we study Revelation chapter 21 
I want you to understand. Heaven is going to blow our mind. But I want you also to understand that by studying it, you're not going to be a country bumpkin when you get there. It's going to be, oh, it's just like Alan described it. I can see the walls. There's the gates. Oh my gosh, he said it was going to be this way. Now, the only reason I'm telling you this is because John already told us what this city is like. So, let's find out what heaven's going to be like. Verse 11. Having the glory of God, talking about this city, having the glory of God and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, what John is telling us in this verse, if we would have read it in conjunction with verse 10, is we would have found that this city is constructed in such a way that it literally reflects the glory of God. Look back at verse number 11. I want you to underline the phrase, clear as crystal. That phrase is translated from the Greek word, krustalitso, which means to shine like crystal or to sparkle like crystal. So what John is telling us, is that this city is made in such a way that it naturally reflects the glory of God. In fact, the type of material that's chosen to construct this city is specifically chosen because of its ability to do that. But it's not the material that we should ooh and awe about. And usually we do that. As we go through and look at this description and you begin to think about it and meditate on it, you're going to go, oh my gosh, that is unbelievable. But it's not the material the construction uh, material that we should ooh and awe over. It's what's causing the building material to shine. And what's causing it to shine is the glory of God. So you need to keep in mind that the city's brilliance is simply the result of God's divine presence. Remember, Jesus told us that in God's house are many mansions. This is God's city. And so you'll hear scholars refer to the New Jerusalem as the city of God. And the reason they do that is because the New Jerusalem is actually God's home. Verse 12. And it had a great wall, or it had a wall great and high. And it had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. That's kind of interesting, but I, I want you to see that the walls of the city are humongous. In fact, it makes it one of the more conspicuous features of the city. If you jump ahead a little bit, we're not going to do that right now. You can if you want. But in verse number 17, it tells us that the walls are 144 cubits tall. Now, people, that's about 216 feet. Well, if you're a football fan and you like to do things in yards, that's 72 yards now, people, that's tall. That's how tall the walls are to the city. But it's not that tall in comparison to how high the city is. According to verse number 16, the city is about 1,400 to 1,500 miles high or tall. Now, if that's the case and the wall is only 216 feet high, then the wall would actually be out of proportion to the height of the city. So it could be saying that the walls are actually 216 feet thick. And that's how the NIV and the NLT translates this. Look at how they translate it in verse number 7. The NLT says, Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick. But either way, whether the walls are 72 yards high or whether the walls are 70 to 72 yards thick, I just want you to see that these walls are humongous. Now, in the ancient world, walls were essential for protecting the city in a time of war. But people, that's not the purpose of the walls in this case. Because there are no enemies to defend. So the walls only have two functions. First of all, these walls are symbolic. They symbolize the eternal security of the city's inhabitants. They are a constant reminder to us that we are safe and secure in God's presence. Secondly... The walls are meant to reflect the glory of God, just like everything else in the city. You see, verse number 18 tells us that the walls are made of jasper. Now, in John's day, when they referred to jasper, they weren't referring to what we would refer to jasper as today. Today, we have different types of jasper. And the mo most common one is what is known as red jasper. But in John's day, when you referred to jasper, you were actually referring to the more rare green jasper. 
Now, green jasper is an opaque stone, which means that light is reflected on it. It sparkles when light hits it. So the main purpose of the walls are to reflect the glory of God. Now, here's a picture of green jasper. You see that? That is green jasper. So when you get to heaven, you're going to see this city that's 1,400 to 1,500 miles wide. And these walls are at least... 72 yards high, and the substance that these walls are made out of is this green jasper. We're also told in verse number 12 that there are 12 gates with an angel at each gate. Now, you need to understand something. These angels are not stationed at the gates to guard the city. Instead, they function as a greeter who welcomes the righteous into the city. Remember, there's no one to keep out at this time. Everyone that was wicked, everyone that rejected Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior has been thrown into the lake of fire. We have now entered into the eighth cosmic day. This is a new creation. The old world, the corrupt world has already been destroyed. So this city that's been in heaven all of a sudden descends and it rests upon the new earth. And we're going to find out why that is when we get to verse number 24. But at this point I just want you to see that there's no need to have these angels functioning as a guard at the city's gates. So why are they there? Well, they're there to welcome the righteous into the city. So we have this little thing where we think that St. Peter is going to be the one that lets us in to the gates of heaven. But I've got news for you. St. Peter is not going to be meeting you there. That's a Roman Catholic myth. Who's going to welcome you into the gates? The angels that are stationed at the gate. Which gate will you enter into? It depends on where you're from. Yes. And that angel will say, come on in to the house of God. Now, on each gate is the name of one of the twelve tribes, which serves as a reminder of the distinctive role that Israel has played in the salvation of mankind. It was through Israel that the Messiah came. We need to understand as Christians the root of Christianity. Our roots go back into Judaism. Our roots go back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then from Jacob, the 12 tribes. God wants to remind us of the distinctive role that Israel has played in the salvation of mankind. It was through Israel that the Messiah came. And had it not been for Israel, no one would ever have entered into the gates of heaven. And that's what God wants to remind us of. That's why Israel plays a special role in God's plan. And that's also why Israel has a special place in God's heart. Because it was... It was Israel who allowed the Messiah to come and who kept the word of God pure for us to be able to take it and build his church upon it. And we need to understand that. Verse 13. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. With three gates on each side, there's access from every direction. Now again, this is symbolic. It symbolizes that heaven's gates are open to anyone and everyone that accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. North, south, east, and west. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, heaven's gates are open to you. And that's the symbolism of putting the three gates on on the four different sides. So, again, if you're from the west, America, Canada, those, we're going to enter into the gates on the west side. If you're from uh, Asia, you're going to enter on the gates from the east side. At least that's what most scholars believe. In fact, what this is showing is that from every direction, from all four corners of the world, the gospel has gone out and it has brought people in from every tongue, every nation, every tribe. And everyone is welcome in God's house. Verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, there are some scholars that teach that this new Jerusalem is going to be suspended in air just above the earth. You're going to have this new earth, and we're going to explain why God would actually have an earth. Why didn't we just keep this new Jerusalem up in heaven? Why do we have to have a new earth? Well, we're going to get to that when we get to verse number 24. 
But there are some scholars that say when this new Jerusalem, this city, descends from heaven, from its original place, it's not going to actually sit down upon this new earth, but it's going to be suspended in air just above it. But verse number 14 indicates otherwise. Think about it. Why would you need a foundation if the city is suspended in air? You wouldn't. So verse number 14 indicates that the city will rest upon the new earth. It won't be suspended on air. Well, right now it is because it's in heaven. But one day, it's going to need that foundation. Right now, that foundation is just symbolic. But one day, it's going to descend upon this new earth and it will need it. Now, according to this verse, the walls of the city sit on 12 foundations. And each foundation is formed from a solid precious stone. Let me go ahead and read, if you don't mind, verses 19 through 20. <sighs> Getting older, and so I need glasses when I read. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, a chalced chalcedony. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, uh, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, a topaz. The tenth, a chrysoprasus. The eleventh, adjacent. The twelfth, an amethyst. So we've got all of these precious stones that these uh, foundations are made of. Each stone or each foundation is made out of a different stone. Now, we're not told whether the foundation stones are stacked on top of each other or if they're laid side by side with each found foundation stone actually supporting a portion of the wall. What we do know is that on the foundation stone or on each foundation stone is the name of one of the 12 apostles which obviously alludes to the church. And let me explain why I say that. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20, it says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so we understand that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles. And this is what this is saying. So this is alluding to the church. The church or I should say heaven is sitting upon the foundation of the teaching of the apostles. So on each of the foundation stones is the name of an apostle. And on each gate, if you remember, is the name of one of the twelve tribes. Symbolizing that the city encompasses both dispensations. Old Testament and New Testament. And that both Israel and the church have their place in the New Jerusalem. In a sense, what this is doing is emphasizing the unity of these two covenant groups. In other words, Old Testament and New Testament saints are one group and we're going to live inside the city together. Now this is kind of interesting because your next door neighbor just might be Daniel or Moses or Elijah or Enoch or David or maybe some of the lesser known ones. But anyways... I want you to understand Old Testament saints and New Testament saints are going to be there. Because the whole reason that we're in God's home in this city is because of the apostles and because of the nation of Israel. Because of the sacrifice they played, we have a place in heaven. And this symbolizes the unity of that. Verses 15 and 17. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city. And the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square. In other words, it's not a rectangle. It's not an octagon. It's not any weird shape. It is a square. All right? And the length is as large as the breadth. That's why we know it's not a rectangle. The length is the same as the depth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, did you catch that? The length, the breadth, and the height are all 12,000 furlongs. They're all equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man. That is, the angel did the measuring. Now, we get to the measurements of the city. And this is very important. Because every person who's ever been saved is going to be living in this city. Every Old Testament saint's going to be living in the city. Every New Testament saint's going to be living in the city. And if you think about it, people, that is a lot of people. So it makes me wonder 
Is this city big enough to hold everyone that's ever been saved? So let's look at the size of the city and let's find out. Basically, this city, as I've already told you, is 1,400 to 1,500 miles wide, 1,400 to 1,500 miles deep, and 1,400 to 1,500 miles high. Now, let me explain how I got those numbers and why I'm saying 1,400 to 1,500 instead of just giving you an exact number. All right? The King James Version gives the city's measurements in furlongs. Of course, in the Greek, it's stadion. But either way, the truth is there's a little bit of a discrepancy on how long that is. How long is a furlong? How long is a stadion? Some say that a furlong is an eighth of a mile. Others say it's 600 feet. Either way, it's somewhere between. We know it's at least 1,400 miles, and it could be as high as 1,544 miles. So if we want to be, or want to get technical, it's in between 1,400 to 1,544 miles. Now, the city is a perfect cube. Let's just go with 1,400. That'd be all right. It can always be bigger than that, so I'll just use 1,400 as a number. It's 1,400 miles wide. It's 1,400 miles deep. It's 1,400 miles high or tall. Now, to give you an example of how big this is, because we're just throwing numbers out here, let me show you a, a picture of a map of America, and let me compare it to that. The city of heaven is approximately half the size of the United States. It stretches from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. And from the middle of the Great Lakes all the way to the edge of California. People, that's how large this city is. Now, just in case you don't think it's big enough to hold all of the people that's ever been saved, let me remind you that it is 1,400 miles high. So how many stories does it have? Well, it doesn't tell us. But let's do a little what ifs, if you don't mind. If each story was 20 foot tall, and let's, let's think about this. Most of our houses have an 8 foot ceiling, right? Now, if you went a little bit more and you wanted to make it uh, more custom, you went 9 foot. Some of you went 10 foot. Maybe you have a cathedral ceiling. In the middle of your cathedral ceiling, if you have 10 foot walls like my living room does, I have a cathedral ceiling. It goes up to about 15 feet. You walk into my house and it's like, boy, this is big. So we're going to go even taller than that. We're going to talk about 20-foot ceilings. So if every story was 20-foot tall, you'd have 369,600 stories. Would you like to get on an elevator that has 369,600 buttons? Oh, just take me up to the 350,000th story. Can you see what I'm saying? Now, some of you think, well, how are you going to get around in this? Remember, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to have a glorified body. Remember when Stephen was translated? Or Philip, I'm sorry. Do you remember when Jesus suddenly appeared when the doors were locked? And they went through a wall? It's like, Psh, you're there. So, that's not going to be a problem. Because I know some of you are like me and you don't like to exercise. And you're thinking, well, good gosh. I'm not going to want to get around in this city. Right? Well, good news. You're going to have a glorified body. Now, if you're a mathematical person, like John Dominopoulos, uh, Bill King, maybe my dad, Eddie, someone like that, l let me just throw a mathematical number out there if you don't mind. Grant Osborne says that the city has a volume of 3,375,000,000 cubic miles. Now, I'm not a mathematician, so if that's wrong, you guys can figure it all up, come back and tell me, and I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll correct it next week. But can you imagine 3,375,000,000 cubic miles? More than large enough. More than large enough for every person that's ever been saved to have the biggest mansion that you could imagine. The saints from every tribe, language, people, and nation will live there. Now, let me give you a little trivia tidbit, if you don't mind. This city is a perfect cube. Can you think of anything in the Old Testament that was a perfect cube? Can you think of anything in the Old Jerusalem that was a perfect cube? Let's narrow it down a little bit more. In the Old Jerusalem was the temple of God. 
Can you think of anything in the temple that was a perfect cube? The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was constructed to be a perfect cube. Did you say that, Terry? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Terry got that too. It's a perfect cube. Now that's amazing because it was a pattern of what's in God, what's in the heavens. And so I want you to understand, when you went through the veil into the Holy of Holies, supposedly that was the presence of God. Do you realize that when you go into the city, it's a perfect cube? The reason it's a perfect cube is because you're in the presence of God. Verse 18. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. This is where we get when we're talking about heaven. Streets of gold. See, most of you... We, we have these impressions that, it, that, that, that really contradict each other. We think of it as being like we're in, we're in these clouds and we can't see the floor. And then we'll talk about the streets of gold in heaven. Where do we get the streets of gold? Right here. The city, as well as the streets, are made of pure gold. But this gold is unlike anything that we've ever seen. Because gold is not transparent. But that's what this verse is saying, and so is verse number 21. Just kind of skip ahead, if you don't mind, and look at verse number 21. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. So this pure gold is like anything that we've ever seen before. It's so pure that it's transparent. That's kind of interesting, because we can refine gold as much as we want, and it's not transparent. So this is going to be something supernatural. Now, why would God... Want the city and the streets to be made of gold so pure that it's as transparent as glass. Well, I'll tell you why. Gold is traditionally the most valuable valuable metal that we know. It's the most valuable metal in the world. But it won't allow light to shine through it. It won't allow the glory of God to shine through it. So God's going to do something so supernatural it's going to blow our minds. He's going to make the city and streets of gold so pure that it's transparent, just so his glory can shine through everything. Now, what's interesting is that this is written in such a way that it indicates that the transparency of the gold is linked to its purity. In other other words, the reason this gold is transparent is because it's so pure. Now, the implication of this is that this gold or this type of gold cannot be made in this world because this world is a corrupt world. All the gold that we know is corrupt. Everything on this this planet is corrupt. And so when God makes this new world, he's going to be able to make gold so pure. It's going to be like anything, unlike anything that we've ever seen in the world. Only in heaven can gold be made this pure. So pure it's transparent. I'm sure it's going to be a different type of metal and kind of gold in it. I I don't know what it is. But it is gold so pure that it will actually be transparent. Verses 19 and 20. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. Verse 21, we already covered that. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several, several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Now notice that each gate is carved from a single pearl. Now, I want you to think about this. There's only three gates on each side of the city. And each side is about 1,400 to 1,500 miles long. Now, can we put that slide of America back up here? Is that possible? Now, I want you to think, in between the Gulf of Mexico to Canada, on one side of that, you only have three gates. Wow. Wow. So what's that tell us? These gates must be huge. Some scholars estimate that they're going to be several miles in length, several miles wide. Now, some of you are thinking, but Alan, that won't matter. You said we're going to have these glorified bodies. We're going to find someone else on this new earth. And they're not going to be like that. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Can you imagine gates... These large that are carved out of one pearl. 
People that's beyond our imagination. Now, you need to understand something about pearls. Among the ancient civilizations, pearls were ranked as the most valuable of all the precious stones. They were more valuable than diamonds, more valuable than rubies. And the reason they were is because their beauty is derived entirely from nature. They did not have the ability that we have today to be able to cut diamonds the way that we do. And so they got their beauty from nature, and human workmanship could not improve upon them. And this is why pearls were so valuable back then. But this is also where we get the, the expression, the pearly gates. I mean, you have people that aren't even saved, and they're talking, well, when I get to the pearly gates, where do they get that? From Revelation chapter 21. Verses 22 and 23. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, why is there no temple? Because God is going to dwell among us without any barriers. People, there is not going to be a veil to separate us from the presence of God. We will be in the presence of God. Everything that kept us out of the presence of God has been done away with. We are brand new creations with no longer a sin body. We'll have a glorified body. We'll be able to come into the presence of God. For this reason, there is no veil. There is nothing to keep us from the presence of God. As a result, the city itself is the temple of God. Trivia. That is why the city is a cube. It is the temple of God because of God's presence there. The city is the temple. And because there's nothing to veil the presence of God, there's not going to be any need for light. Wow. Why? Because God's presence is going to emit constant light. The sun and the moon won't need to shine in the city. Why? Because the glory of God is going to provide all the illumination that we need. Now, I'm going to throw up here a city, but don't do it just yet. I want to make some uh, disclaimers here. Clarence Larkin actually drew this, and it is not a good depiction of the city of God, of the city that you're going to go to when you die. And the reason it's not is because it's not a cube. He drew it as a pyramid. But I still want you to kind of get an idea so you'll get out of your minds that this is a cloudy place up there with angels on the clouds, all right? Let's throw that city up there. Can we do it? You see that? There's the foundation. You'll see the names of the apostles. There's Peter, there's James, there's John on the foundation. Notice that on top of the gates that there's a name you can barely read. But what are those names? The tribes. See the angels inside? And then you see all of these homes. And of course, he's bringing it up as a, as a pyramid, but it won't be a pyramid. It's a cube. And so this thing is going to be huge. But this is kind of like... What you're going to go to. So if you've had this uh, different picture of heaven, throw it out of your mind. You want to know what heaven's like? Streets of gold. You've got a mansion there. You can call it a dwelling place. Call it what you want. But it's going to be great. But more valuable than all of the uh, building material that's there is going to be God's divine presence.